So we're starting to look at, so we've been talking about tensegrity in the context of these paradigms that don't work. There's this general ideas about stretching and exercise and what those prevent or uh, promote. And there's a lot of kind of misinformed practices that aren't getting at the root of actual issues. And something that really affects that is the nature and characteristics of fascial tissue. So these episodes are really going to be a deeper dive into fascial tissue. About fascial tissue, not just in the context of rolfing, but more specifically in the context of the dimension approach, and especially kind of the evolution of, of your understanding from, from your training in rolfing through what you kind of call the, the infusion of the subtle realm into the, the treatment of physical issues. How do you get tissue to lengthen out? Right. That is not well understood by humans. Right. How do you make it stronger? A lot of the strength and the, the ability to be quick with physical movements and, and to do, to jump, to run, to punch, to lift a weight, to move around. We rely on the elasticity of the fascial tissue, which is different than muscle fibers contracting. So if you think about it, you know, just in general terms, if you think of the fascial tissue as being kind of static, it's like a rubber band where muscle tissue is, is a bunch of fibers that are either contracting or, or releasing. If you're going to, uh, for example, jump up in the air and then come down, it, it, it plays into even really small, subtle movements. But if you take something like jumping up and, and then coming down, as you're going to catch your weight, your thigh muscles are going to contract, right? To, to do, they're going to do this eccentric contraction which means that the, the muscle is actually lengthening, but it's contracting to halt the momentum. Yeah, it makes sense. So you just mean as jumping versus landing? Yeah, when you come down, there's an ex eccentric contraction, right? Oh, right. On, on certain tissues, and then there's a concentric contraction in other tissues. But for example, with an eccentric tra contraction, and, and it's true of concentric as well, but... It, but if you think of an eccentric contraction, the tensional strength that's in that fascial tissue is doing a lot of the work, which is different than the muscle fibers that are embedded in that fascial tissue contracting. The less tensional strength there is in the fascial tissue, the more the muscles are going to have to do the work. Mm. Doing techniques that are making the fascial tissue longer and, and having less elasticity, which seems like, well, there's more mobility, flexibility. You know, yeah, mobility and flexibility, that's where it's at. That's, that's, that's always a, a plus. That's always better. It's like, no, it's not. No, it's not. Because now to perform certain functions, you're going to have less tensional strength in that fascial tissue, which means the muscle tissue is going to have to try to do more and it can't make up for it. And so you're going to be weaker or slower in particular movements. Yeah. I mean, I feel like, I feel like you're going to have to explain that more. So <laughs> I, it feels, it feels huge. So the, there is this encapsulating mesh that is doing a lot of the structural work of our body. And its needs are very different than how we currently understand muscular needs or athletic adaptability, that the stretching isn't going to make you healthier. Right. So what will? Aside from the dimension approach? <laughs> right. What <Well, what> is <laughs> Uh I mean, maybe in like a couple of years you can just say that, but. <laughs> we're not there yet <laughs> not yet so i totally hear you that the challenge is that it's a bunch of things interrelating at once but if you're going to have if you're going to say that stretching is not what we thought it was is there something to put in its place right now of the whole like stretching idea yeah just the this idea that 
go and stretch and your body will get better. To say that stretching does not lengthen fascial tissue isn't, isn't, a, isn't absolutely true, but, but the way we think of it is, is, is wrong. It's fascial tissue. It's, it's a, it's this living tissue that like our skin, you know, our, our skin adapts, right. And, and changes based on, on various things. If you have rubbing on your skin, you, your skin lays down extra fibers to strengthen it, you know, which is a callus, right? The skin gets tougher or less tough depending on, on the strain it's under. And, and so there's this adaptation that happens at a cellular level and the fascial tissues like that. One of the things that happens is the adaptation that the body makes. If you think of bones, when you put bones under compression, the body lays down cells to strengthen the bone. So if you increase the amount of compression that you put a bone under, then the bone, I mean, the body is going to densify right? And beef up that bone. The opposite occurs when you don't put the bone under compressional strain, which is why when people get old and they're doing less and less activity, their bones get more and more brittle, right? And they break easy. Time isn't causing that. It's not just aging over time that causes the bones to get brittle. There, there's a mechanical thing going on, which is that you're not putting them under compression anymore. And then there's this adaptation that the adaptation is that the body's pulling cells from the bone in the same way that if you don't put your skin under the same strain, the callus is going to go away, right? Your, your body's going to start shedding that, that tissue. So again, it's a, it's a paradigm shift. Getting old doesn't make your bones get less dense. Ceasing to put the bones under compression is what makes your bones get less dense. So by the same token, if you put fascial tissue under tensional strain, the body says, okay, I got to beef this tissue up because now I got to deal with, with X amount of tension instead of Y. There's an adaptation. So when you, when you are stretching, your fascial tissue is adapting. And certain kinds of stretching, certain kinds of strain is going to make the body shorten and tighten or, or, you know, tighten meaning make less elastic the tissue. Certain types of activities are going to make it get more elastic and, and more willing to lengthen out. What Ida Rolf figured out, which is why, why Rolfing is, is this bodywork technique versus a, a stretching routine, is that, is that actually when you put fascial tissue under compression, the fascial tissue changes. So compressing fascial tissue, what does that mean? Well, for example, when you drop your elbow <laughs> on someone's thigh, when you lean into it with your elbow, for example, you're compressing tissue. That sounds very sort of uh, blunt. And, 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 and in fact, there's actually, a, you know, there's all these layers of fascial tissue and rolfers are trained to not only sense which layer of tissue is needing to lengthen out, for example, but, but how to lean into the tissue in a, in a real precise way in order to get compression on a particular layer of tissue. The theory or the concept about getting the fascial tissue to change via compression Ida Rolf was a biochemist and studied fascial tissue and kind of figured this out. And there's this whole story about how her son was in a wheelchair. She got him out of, out of the wheelchair by doing the, the work that later became known as Rolfing. But again, the idea is that, that when you put fascial tissue under a compressional strain, it actually causes a cellular change. There's a state shift that the cells undergo. And again, this, the, the science around this gets, gets complicated and there's debate about it. And is that observable? Like, is that something you can see? Yes, there's a state shift. And, and one of the concepts that's out there that, again, it, there's, it's debated because you get more microscopic and, you know, you get into territory that I, I certainly don't claim to have much of an understanding of. But, but there's the idea of it, of what they call the gel to, to Saul theory, which is, is that fascial tissue exists in what's called a gel state. And that when you put it under compression, it actually shifts to a solution. Like oil. So just like the, the pressure of it heats it up and changes. That's right. Okay. 
And in the solution state, fibers are then shed and reabsorbed into the body. So when it cools, it now has shed fibers. And so you you have a more more uh, stretchy material than you did prior. I think that makes sense. I think it's it's tough because it's still this this thing that I, I guess the the only images of it I've seen it's almost it seems more solid than gel. Yeah, right. Least. So how is it? Uh, you know, it's it, I, well. Go ahead. I, I guess I'm just trying. I feel like the example you're giving makes sense that process makes sense as much as it can anything about why it looks the way it does you know i i get the question and i've you know i've had the Thanks. same i was struggling with it <laughs> and, and the basic answer is i don't know i mean and again there's debate about it some people say no it's a solid and it actually turns to a gel again and this it, all sounds like quantum physics well it starts getting into that territory for sure and just the whole, it changes when you observe it and the simultaneous states. and That's where it goes. That's where it went for me. You know, I, the, the chemistry part I didn't dive too deep into is just not where my interest lies. But what I came to later, you know, sitting, sitting with this person on my table, you know, and, and paying attention to the subtleties of their fascial tissue, all day, every day for 25 years now, I started to notice that if I sit and hold my attention on their fascial tissue, their fascial tissue starts changing. I'm not even touching it. You know, I'm sitting there with my hands on my lap and they're laying on the table and I'm, and I'm using my attention to sense into their knee and, and I start to not just conceptualize in my mind, but I, but I start to feel in this empathic, energetic, intuitive way, the varying tensions and, and densities of the fascial tissue. And then as I maintain my focus on it, the densities and, and tensions start changing. Of course, when I first started noticing that, it's like, all right, I think I'm losing my mind here, you know? <laughs> right. Just, I'm going to take a couple weeks off. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. But then the client gets off the table and goes, oh, my God, my knee hasn't felt this, uh, you know, this good in 20 years. And it's kind of like, wait, you didn't touch my knee. You know, it's like <laughs> super exciting and, and almost scary. Yeah, eerie. Yeah. It's cool. I was wondering, I feel like that's, that's kind of the exciting thing of it. We'll talk about miracles at some point, but the miraculous side of it that gets might get too out there until you actually talk to somebody who it worked for which which i know that 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 you've done and continue to do in the kind of longer narrative of both your life and of healing in general where you've looked at these different fixes and these different approaches to treating symptoms and causes you're sharing this dimension approach you're sharing your experience of the interrelation of these different factors and what the best practice is. What is the next step? When you share your story, you hear the, the different fixes that didn't work as far as physical therapy, chiropractic work, rolfing on its own, or, you know, just integrity. Right. And what you're bringing to it is, a combination of different practices that get at a bigger truth than my leg hurts in order to like distinguish the dimension approach from these other ideas or these other modalities. I feel like wondering or just thinking about what is after the dimension approach. Yeah. And this isn't like a deconstructionist thing. It's just like from a practical perspective, what I heard and what you were saying is there's a lot of like self healing that's possible which is a cool potential. Yeah. So do you see the dimension approach as being something someone could learn to use on themselves? Uh, yes, no doubt. So that's, that's huge. So the thing that to me distinguishes it from the other things you've been through 
is that it's not someone looking at your symptom and saying, I'm going to fix it. It's looking at someone's symptom, seeing an underlying cause that they have to learn for themselves and then in that way heal themselves. Yeah. That's huge. So to me, like that is what distinguishes it. And that is what is like encouraging about it is it as complicated as it is, the goal is to incorporate it, not have it administered to you. Yes, and the methodology of the dimension approach, witnessing, holding, containing, mirroring, is a methodology that facilitates the person becoming aware of it. Like that's, that's its effect. If I hold my attention on their knee, their, their fascial tissue starts changing. But to really get the change that needs to happen, their consciousness needs to get in touch with their knee. That's how there's going to be permanent change, and, and that's how we're going to get at the root of the problem. And how, how do I help them get their consciousness back to that layer, that portion, that, that part of their knee? The way I get their attention there is not to just say, hey, look, it's this, it's this ligament right here in your knee because, because there's resistance, there's defense, there, the, there's a reason they're not going there. And what's in between their attention and that part of their knee is trauma. Super intense energetic charge, super intense psychological and emotional defenses, splitting that are impediments to their conscious attention getting back at their knee and and you know they might be able to say yeah no i see it you know yes i i'm able to see my knee and feel my knee and yes i see the ligament and feel the ligament you're talking about okay that doesn't mean your consciousness is getting where it needs to go so the the, sure. the, the dimension For approach sure. methodology is how do we get their conscious mind back in touch with that part of their knee and how do, how do you get through all these layers of defense like well, that's the nature of of the of all this these different types of work, and and again, it's well initially witness it, then hold it, then contain it, and then the crucial point is all right to mirror it. If I can mirror back to the person's conscious mind, I'm I'm acting as a bridge that they start reconnecting to that place. That that's the methodology. And again, whether it's a ligament in their knee, or whether it's an emotion, or whether it's a thought, or you know. It's always that methodology. That's why I, you know, I'm saying that, okay, that methodology, the dimension approach methodology, witnessing, holding, containing, mirroring, and contact is simply designed to get them back in touch. And, and, and I'm not the designer <laughs> of that. I'm pointing out that design, that that is the human design. We're all, again, you know, and I've said it a million times, I'll say it again, we're all either doing the dimension approach or not doing it moment to moment with this or that. How, and this is maybe a long-term question, but like what is a healthcare system that incorporates these goals and ideals look like? Yeah, it's, a, it, 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 uh, it, it's one of the reasons these paradigms don't, don't get out there and don't get accepted is, is, a, you know, that very thing. It, it's that it would require a, a restructuring of, of the system altogether. The time factor, for example, I mean, I'm, I'm spending, you know, if someone, if someone comes in for 50 sessions, I mean, I'm spending 50 hours with them, you know, and, right. And the, and, you know, every minute of that hour, I'm, very focused and applying attention in a, in a particular way. There's a lot of time and effort required by the provider that uh, is not, again, is not the paradigm of, of being a doctor is, you know, or being a healthcare practitioner or something, you know, doesn't tend to include that kind of man hours per client. Right, right. And that's what I was kind of excited about this whole project is that the goal isn't to to get more clients like it's not specifically just to get more people to visit the dimension center 
is to get more people to take this approach. Yeah, definitely. Because that's at least from what I get from what you're saying, you know, you've said and what you do is that the, the, the goal is just that more people have this kind of, uh, MO and then as a result, more people have the opportunity to hopefully experience the, the, the healing that is possible. I'm trying to speak to, like you said, change, changes in paradigm and changes in, in approach and how this stuff's looked at versus just trying to round up clients. What's your take on the idea of balancing out weak sides or weak muscle groups? Or uh, like when I tore my ACL, they were all about like your, your VMO is too tight and your quads are under like firing or right. however you say that. Right. Yeah. There, there's, there's, you know, immediately I can think of about five or six paradigms that, uh, that are wrong around that. You know, I had a feeling at the time I didn't like the people telling me <laughs> your VMO is too tight. <laughs> if you look at cause, right. It's like, okay, let's say it's too tight. Well, why, how did it get that way? Not how do you, undo that but like how did it freaking get that way what's causing it to get that way is that cause still happening if you look up and and the ceilings you know starting to have water spots on it you know it's like well we need to re we need to re-sheetrock that ceiling and it's like but is the <laughs> roof still leaking because if the roof's still leaking you know maybe that needs to be looked at so as far as well why did it get tight why is there an imbalance someone says oh there certain muscles are too weak well why are they too weak and it's not because you haven't done enough sit-ups. You shouldn't have to do sit-ups for your abdominal wall to be strong enough. Well, I feel like we should come back to that. Yeah, the whole sit, the whole sit-ups thing again. Uh, there's there's ten paradigms around that that are wrong. So make a note. I'm making a note right now. This is uh, this is going to be for your exercise video series. The current way it's looked at, it's like every statement that comes out of a person's mouth around it. I just want to go eh, wrong. It's not, that's not how it works. So we'll come back to sit-ups because I feel like this is hopefully a magical shortcut that everyone can take to have stronger <laughs> abs. But we'll come, come back to that. So you look at a cause. What is back to the balancing out like muscle areas though, like more specifically, what are they missing and not looking beyond the symptom? If you look at the actual mechanism, it's like, okay, yes, there's agonist and antagonist pairs in the body. You have tissues that, that work in opposition to each other. Certainly you, you get situations where, uh, one, one of the tissues is too short and the other one's too long. You can still be quite, feel like you're quite healthy or be a quite good athlete, but you don't realize you've got, you've got this kind of situation I'm talking about going on in your body that, of course, will show up at some point. You know, a joint will wear out. And it's like, well, that joint wore out because of this, this thing I'm talking about. But they just didn't know that that was happening. If you look at why it happened, is it in the mental, emotional realm? Is it in the subtle realm? Is it in the imaginal realm? And, of course, it's always all of them, but... If, if you're looking at where you might make an intervention, no matter where the cause was, everyone thinks in terms of muscles getting stronger or muscles getting weaker, but th th there's a few different paradigms involved in there. Muscles get strong from use, obviously. And when you have a situation going on tensegrally, what will happen is certain muscles will not get recruited in the way that they should be getting recruited when performing a certain movement. And because they're not getting recruited, you get atrophy. And so you got to look at, you know, it, it's not that the muscle atrophied and therefore are no longer getting recruited. It's that something made them cease to get recruited. And there's a list of things that can cause that physical trauma, emotional trauma, emotional armoring and, and defense patterns, uh, et cetera, just to name a few. 
so if that's the situation, if you if you recognize, oh, my abdominal wall has gotten really weak and and isn't isn't doing its job, and it's like, well, it's you know, it's it's not the the muscles of the abdominal wall aren't being recruited the way they should. And so they're weak. And then we think, oh, well, I'm going to start recruiting them. I'm going to, I'm going to do sit-ups. I'm going to do sit-ups and sit-ups, sit-ups. And, and that's going to get my body recruiting them again. No, it's not. No, it's not. The reason your body's not recruiting them, it isn't being changed. You're, you're not affecting the reason. You're not affecting the cause. And so it doesn't matter how many sit-ups you do. That's not going to undo the trauma that is at the root of why your body's not recruiting your abdominal muscles. And so again, huge paradigm shift. The, the, there's, there's millions of people as we speak doing some exercise, thinking they are going to get their body recruiting a muscle as a result of the repetitions they're doing, and it's not going to work. Because the setting in the brain, the setting in the mind that said we're no longer recruiting that muscle isn't going to change. Which again, it's, it's, like, it's like if your light bulb goes out because the circuit breaker threw that switch or whatever. You, you, can, you can turn that, that, the switch on the lamp on and off 10 million times. That's not going to make the light bulb come on. You got to go to the circuit breaker and get that switch to turn back on. And the circuit, bre- the, the, the circuit breaker switch, so to speak, is in the mind. It's in the mind. It's not, it's not in uh, the tissue. And, and again, you're not going to get the circuit breaker to switch because you're doing sit-ups, for example. I like that. I mean, I think that starts to tie back into the, the approach and, and like what and looking for causes. And the hard part about explaining causes is that it, it's likely not just a physical cause for a physical symptom. Yeah, that's where it goes from okay, the muscle's not working, you start looking at nervous system and you start looking at energy system, those trace right back up into the brain and into the mind and you start looking at the mind, okay, what, what's, where's that switch in the circuit breaker that is the mind? And then it's a whole other conversation that, that we're going to get into in future podcasts. But, you know, how do you get a circuit breaker in the mind to, to switch, which is not a, a simple thing? <laughs> <laughs> it's not a simple concept to understand and it's an even harder thing to accomplish right but there's still hope yes stay tuned <laughs> if you want to learn more about the dimension approach please visit dimensionapproach.com dimension approach